that right? Yes. So I, I just I'm going to start recording. Start recording. Perfect. Let's go. You stop recording, Julian. I did, yes. So I'll, re I'll go through the antitrust policy. The Linux, uh, Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with ethical antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that the attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable U.S. state, federal, or antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in Linux Foundation antitrust policy. <laughs> If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council. Or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew of the Grove of the firm of Gasmer of the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to have our friend Joel Schrevet from China System, which will tell us about, you know, digitalization processing in the trade, international trade. Um, I would leave ground for Joel to, to speak and present solutions. So, Joel. Okay, can I start? Yes, you can. All right, I'll start by sharing my screen. Okay. I can share it. Perfect. Yes, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can, Joel. Okay, perfect, perfect. Right. Okay, well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank, of course, Hyperledged, a special interest group for trade finance, uh, to invite me uh, to have this opportunity to present uh, what China systems are doing in the area of uh, trade digitalization, more specifically okay. uh, digital document technology. Um, uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Joel Schreves. I'm Solutions Director for China Systems. Uh, I'm also part of the uh, trade digitalization services team uh, that we've recently created. And I've got some of my colleagues on the call as well like Felipe, Bruno will be joining. Uh, so if there are more detailed questions after my presentation, especially on the technical side, because I'm more business oriented, then Phil and Bruno will definitely be able to assist on, on those technology related questions. Okay, so the topic uh, for today, uh, what has China Systems done uh, in terms of uh, integrating with digital document uh, technology. Uh, China Systems is part of the ITFA uh, group. We're a member of ITFA, the International Trade and Forfeiting Association, which, which actually groups quite a number of banks and also fintechs who aim to innovate uh, trade and digitize trade. And it's in the context of, of our ITFA membership that we've cooperated with one of the other members to uh, come to a collaborative solution uh, which aims to tackle the challenge of documents in trade. Trade is not just about data, that makes it a, a challenging uh, topic. Uh, they're, they're, part, they're very much part of the flow in trade. So if you cannot crack that nut, crack, cannot solve that problem of the documents, you have a challenge. So when we looked at the technology, we first defined a number of criteria. Uh, because we could be looking for a tactical solution, for a vertical industry, vertical solution, but those typically we'll do on a project basis, but you wanted to look for something fundamental, something which could be globally deployed across industry. So that's one of the criteria we set. The key criteria that we defined for a digital trade document solution uh, were the following. The solution had to be future-proof. Hmm? Uh, you can talk about standards in trade or in any business, in fact, until the cows come home. Uh, nothing ever will get done. So yeah, what we wanted to start today, so it had to be a solution 
that could support adoption, early adoption, can be implemented today, but is also future-proof. Standards is not a destination. It's going to be an ongoing process. That's why it's called transformation. Another key criteria is that is based on the fact that if you look at just the, the number of networks and systems involved in trade processing, it's immense. It's, it's a very diverse uh, business area. Uh, back office systems, portal systems, SWIFT, the new upcoming DLT based trade platforms, we trade, uh, Comgo, but also on the quarter side, uh, Contour, Marco Polo. There's new platforms, well, almost every quarter there is a new uh, platform coming out. So it, this cannot, well, it could continue, but ultimately there has to be some consolidation. And the key thing is, behind those systems and behind those networks, there's people behind it. Those people require documents. They require documents to take decisions uh, because documents trigger cash flow, documents trigger release of goods, etc., etc. So it would be unthinkable that uh, if you think about what DHL and FedEx or UPS, what they do today, they are currently the physical couriers in, in the document world. Imagine they would say, I can only send a document to a customer that I have onboarded into my platform. That's not going to work. So it has to support full interoperability. There should be the, the limits that exist in the physical world, that, which there are no limits in terms of sending letters with documents. We should apply the same criteria in, in, in the digital world. Another key criteria is that uh, if you, of course, make it open, one of the challenges, of course, is if you do not process a document inside a closed environment, yes. where you can control identity, or where you can control security, you immediately have a challenge that you say, well, how? Am I going to check whether this document has not been tampered with? How can I check its originality? How can I prove who is the owner of the document? So that's why the digital document uh, technology needs to provide a solution for that. It's something that the banks experienced, uh, and it, this, is a, this is a quote from an ICC report uh, on, on COVID. What did banks do, uh, what, or what are they still doing today? Uh, they're scanning documents. Uh, they are typically using SWIFT File Act to send them from one bank to the other. And they're sending an authenticated SWIFT message to confirm that the documents are truly originals and authentic documents. So, and what happens then afterwards is that the bank who are the recipients, they start making phone calls to confirm whether the documents sent are actually really originals. And they even want to check, can I find the name of the person who sent it? So, in today's world of technology, that looks a bit uh, archaic. So what is required, if you want to freely transport digital documents, you should have a neutral service, a digital notary service, which is able to prove data integrity, originality, and ownership. So a 24 by 7 public digital notary service is required. And typically for that purpose, a DLT-based notary service is probably most suitable. Another key requirement is, again, for the first argument, I said standards is a never-ending journey. So the solution, the digital container, which is actually going to store the business data and also the technical data, needs to support an open standard. Uh, I recently read an article where the, where the CEO of Bolero was saying, uh, because there's about nine types of bills of lading, he said, yes, if we move to one standard for bills of lading, our secret source will probably disappear, gradually disappear. But he also said, in fact, the secret source should not be in the standard. The secret source should be in the service. Yeah? For the end users, it is very important that we operate on same standards, but that we compete on the digitalization services around the standard, not the standard itself. So the solution is to provide a digital container, and the industry should be able to define the contents, and that should be possible on an ongoing basis. Well, since we are a technology vendor, a key point, of course, is the digital document needs to provide a configurable schema because we want to use that digital container efficiently to trigger other processes. And trade data flows to at least 20. If you look at the letter of credit, there's on average about 20 parties involved. You can imagine the flow of that data, which is often the same data, 
it should be possible to have API connectivity between those players and actually reuse the source data as much as possible based on an STP process. This is quite technical, I won't lose too much time on this, but you probably all know about the Trust Over IP Foundation project which has been kicked off with, whereby digital identity becomes portable. That could be a real game changer and even further support this. If digital identity becomes portable across back office systems, across other networks, across DLT platforms, that's when digital documents will also become really portable. From a user perspective, very important and, and, and not to be underestimated, we have to make sure that if we provide a technology solution for our customers and for the customers of our customers, that it has to be fully transparent. We should camouflage the technology as much as possible. Uh, we have to focus on end user benefits. What are those end user benefits? Uh, the most obvious one in COVID times, and especially in trade, very relevant. It is really silly if someone cannot collect his goods or go to the port or go to the airport because he has not received his bill of lading uh, and, and is able to use that document of title to, to, to request delivery of those goods. So for business continuity purposes, there should be no dependency on physical delivery and scanning of documents. Another key benefit, if the criteria that I previously defined are respected, a user should not have to join a specific platform to participate in a digital document exchange. There are simply too many participants in a documentary flow to think that you are able to create one system globally across all industries to solve this. So you need to come up with an approach whereby digital documents can flow through all the existing infrastructures that where you have a neutral digital notary service, you can check authenticity, originality, and ownership. Very important in the design of our solutions, and when we when we built our, our solution, it says it's so key, we have to create a digital experience. Generating a digital document is extremely easy. That is not the objective, and that's why at the top right corner, you see an iceberg. Why the iceberg? Because digital documents are just the tip of the iceberg. The real value lies in the optimization of the business processes, the use of the rich data around those digital documents to make process more efficient, typically in a collaborative way, because trade is an extremely collaborative business. One example that you will see when we do the actual demonstration, there's gonna be a demonstration of a system. Uh, we have taken the business case of digital guarantees. I will explain to you why just before I start the demo. But we've also optimized and digitized all the related processes to the digital guarantee document. Not just the document itself. It will become clear in the demonstration. Another benefit, and it doesn't look like an obvious one because uh, bankers will immediately say, oh, KYC. Yes, KYC compliance does, is still remains a challenge. However, from a technology point of view, if you're able to start exchanging digital documents in a secure way, and we will see how, how that is being achieved, you automatically also, at least from an integration point of view, establish a relationship with a third party, which does not have to be a customer of the bank. We will also illustrate that. And it becomes possible for banks to start offering services to non-customer and potentially onboard them. If they have their own platform, they can do that. But it's, it, it, it's a much open, more open world, and it will become clear from the demonstration. This is, yeah, I'm not going to, uh, what we've tried to, 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 to clarify from this diagram is this is more or less what happens in trade if someone generates a document on the left side because a document starts from data, typically put in PDF, printed, etc., and it goes through an entire flow where on the receiving side, you use OCR and artificial intelligence to get that data back out of that piece of paper and start processing the content. So that's the typical flow. Now, how can you come up with, that's the reality of today, and you've got all those systems behind it. So what can you do today to create the lowest friction 
approach possible for a digital document uh, strategy. I've used those color codes. Let's start with the black ones. Uh, the black ones, why they become redundant. Why? Because preparing of mail, putting stuff into an envelope, scanning it then to keep a copy of the signed version. Uh, on the receiving side, again, the mail room, scanning it, uh, all of that disappears. The, the infrastructure, let's move to the green part. In the physical world, the couriers, the physical couriers are the, are the channel. They are transporting, they're taking delivery of a, of, a, of a document and they are delivering it, hopefully, to the right person at the door of, of the right company, uh, to the right person. So it's quite a tricky process if you think about it. That's the competition, a piece of paper going from one part of the world to the other. The delivery in the digital world, and that's why I say it's low friction, we should be able to use all infrastructure that exists today. So if some people want to use Swift Firelight to send digital documents, why not? You can perfectly do that. If you want to send it over WeTrade, if, so, if someone wants to upload a digital document and get it across and you have interoperability potentially with another blockchain, why not? It should be perfectly possible. That's why it's called low friction. You should not have to onboard everyone to the same platform. So all the existing infrastructure can be reused. The two remaining colors, let's start with the blue. Blue is where we have worked with our partner and it's one solution. I'm not saying this is the only solution, but it's a, it's a DLT based solution, a digital notary for, for that we are integrating with. And the solution is provided by our partners in EGO and the solution is called Trace Original. What do they do? It's actually quite simple. And sometimes the best things in life are simple. Instead of printing to a, to, to, to a, a printer, they're printing to a digital file. They are, of course, can integrate with digital signature software, whether it's Signicat or anything else. It doesn't really matter. That's open. And on the receiving side, they are providing verification mechanisms. There is a public ledger which stores hashes and technical reference. And that's the digital notary. It does not have to be run by, by, by an EDO. If we're looking at other partners, typically chambers of commerce. Let's say if you talk about certificates of origin or in certain countries guarantees, chambers of commerce could be perfect institutions to be a digital notary to certify certificates of origin, for example. So, and the orange part, that's where the back office, the portal vendors, the business intelligence vendors come in, the transaction engines, those who process the content, convert the content, provide the business rules around. And that's typically something which China System does. But we've integrated this with our partner in EGO, and we've gone fully digital. Uh, the next slide, I'm going to skip this one. If I have enough time, I will explain this at the end, because this is our vision, I think, of what we see how standardization in trade should be really tackled. Uh, but I'll keep that one for the end if we still have time. This is the one, I think, the last one I want to show to you before I start uh, talking about the demonstration. It looks like a complex slide. I've written an article about it to try and explain it, but it's actually fairly simple. Again, at the top of this diagram, you see what happens today. Physical documents. Here you've got some of your actors. I couldn't get more on this slide because you've got Chamber of Commerce, but these are the typical actors or, or participants to a trade document flow. And there's many of each of those, yeah? These are the corporates, the SMEs, etc. Those physical documents today, they're sent by couriers across all those parties, from one to another. In a typical, you'll see at least four, sometimes five or six participants. In the digital world, and behind all those, those parties, they are running all those systems, ERP systems, trade contract platforms, trade portals, uh, document registries, the, where the warehouse receipts go, where the certificates of origin go, the trade back of the systems like, like, like Chinese systems, SWIFT. Then you have the networks that are there. You can't change all of that. Eh? It's impossible. So you have to find a solution how can we transport a digital document across this infrastructure? And that's what I'm illustrating at the bottom. Digital documents need to be portable across the platform. And what the key thing is that you're actually transporting the business data. 
So the digital container, the equivalent of a paper document, needs to contain two big portions. The business data to satisfy the needs of all the systems, and then hashes and technical references which enable a neutral DLT-based notary service to actually certify and make the, the exchanges secure. The proof of ownership, the proof of originality, the proof of data integrity. So on the ledger, the ledger does not store one single character of business data. The content is hashed. If you have this in place, and that's what we'll show in the demonstration, you can have APIs in place. You just need to provide an API to this system. They interact with the digital notary, the public service, to verify ownership, verify originality, create proof of ownership, transfer ownership, because transfer of ownership is one of the key things, of course. How do you know who is the owner of the document? In the physical world, most of the time, know it because it's very easy to create copies. In this situation, we can have copies, but there can only be one owner. So this API service interacts with this DLT-based notary service. I won't go into portable digital identity. This becomes another uh, facilitator of this process, but I want to get to the demonstration as quickly as possible. Uh, the demo scenario that I will be showing, uh, it's, it's quite business oriented. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, I do not know how many business people are on yours, but that has been the objective to show what we have done. Uh, we've taken a digital guarantee. Why did we take a digital guarantee? Because in ITFA, the focus is actually on digital negotiable instruments, bills of exchange, promissory notes, because those are very powerful instruments, also documents of title, bill of lading. The challenge with those documents is that the number of participants and the legal implications are much bigger. The advantage of a digital guarantee is, especially a direct one, you only have three involved parties. An applicant, typically an issuing bank, and a beneficiary. Where are these guarantees used? Typically at the domestic level, it's very big business and it's all paper-based. It's typically used in countries where the government, for example, if you've got uh, construction companies or infrastructure companies uh, doing big infrastructure projects, the government will often ask those companies, can you provide me with a guarantee for those activities? A performance guarantee or performance bond, typically. And a bank will typically issue it. So a bank will take the liability of this construction company and guarantee to the government that they are, that they are good for, for, for the value of that project. So this is what we'll be demonstrating. The first flow we will be focusing is on the issuance process. And in the issuance process, a guarantee is actually physically, in the physical world, it's changing owner from the bank to the beneficiary. So what we are doing is, we are digitizing or digitalizing this transfer of ownership. And there is the digital notary will be able to verify whether this guarantee is actually real and authentic. In the second part of the demonstration, we're illustrating, we've, we've, we've shown we can do more than just create a digital document. We've also digitized all the subsequent processes of the digital guarantee. Because a digital guarantee can typically be claimed but in many cases, it does not happen. Those are very long life cycle instruments. What usually happens is they can sit in a filing cabinet for 20 years and nothing happens. Only when the party does not perform, uh, typically a claim or a demand request takes place. So this is the flow that I will be illustrating in the demonstration. The key parties are, I will be using an EGOR partner as the applicant of the guarantee, and they will be delivering digital document technology to the Swedish government, the beneficiary, and the issuing bank in our business scenario will be Exim Mills Bank. So those will be the three parties involved. This is a slide, I, I've included this one because it gets you in the right mindset and it, it allows you to focus on what is the objective of the demo. Because what, something I've not said yet is, I've talked about digital containers, but this is actually really, uh, and, and I've done this mainly for business people, how do you control the transfer of ownership? And it's based on PKI infrastructure. Uh, so I've used some, it's quite a colorful slide, but you look at, I've used a vault or a safe 
to illustrate the concept of the notary. It's not probably the best of comparison, but it's aimed to, 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 to focus on the security. So when a bank creates a guarantee, they encrypt this guarantee with their public key. So in terms of the ownership, there is in the technical section of the digital document, there is a public key. So at this point, before the, the, the guarantee moves to another party, only the issuing bank can use the correspondent private key to decrypt the information. So public-private key infrastructure, what happens then? If you want to change the ownership of a digital document instead of using a courier service, what you're doing is you're communicating with the beneficiary and the beneficiary has to provide its public key. Typically what we do in the process, and you will see that, when the beneficiary sees the guarantee, to accept it, when he says, yes, this is the guarantee and I agree to it, he provides his public key. And at that point, the bank will encrypt the digital document with the public key of the beneficiary. And that public key then gets subsequently in the technical section of the digital document, gets replaced. The owner key now becomes the key of the beneficiary. From that moment on, only the beneficiary has the correspondent private key to actually to open the vault and prove I am the only owner. Even if there's someone else as a copy, the private key proves that he's the owner. So that's a short uh, explanation, but you will see that in the demonstration. So now the actual demonstration, uh, something about this. This was uh, a much longer demonstration. Uh, in, it was originally about 16 minutes. I've now reduced it to 11 minutes to, to respect uh, the time frame that I was given. So instead of showing you the full flow, uh, we have reduced it. But the system you will see, the eggs and bills back of the system that you will see, is the same one that we use to issue SWIFT guarantees, is the same one that we use to issue paper guarantees and digital guarantees. From a user point of view, it's fully transparent for him. He does not even know uh, whether he, what type of guarantee is issuing. Uh, I'm also skipping the, the part of the flow where we show you how to define the guarantee templates. If there's business people in there, we can always do a follow-up session for you to say, how do you generate those digital guarantees? We've got, of course, an editor for technical people. This is all, all a given, but I'm skipping that step as well. So we've also skipped the portal interaction because a guarantee starts from an applicant, typically a corporate or an SME. I've skipped this part, so the entire drafting process, I'm sure the people from Bolero will know this, the drafting process between the applicant and the bank, I'm skipping that part as well because it makes the demo too long and a bit too heavy on the business side. So I'm starting from the moment that the back office receives the guarantee application and they will issue the guarantee. So all the data is already there. So I'm going to start uh, the presentation now. Are there, meanwhile, any questions on what I've said so far? No questions? Then I'll kick off the demonstration. Everyone can still hear me eh? because sometimes if things are too quiet. Yeah, yeah we can. Uh, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, right. so we're starting the demonstration part now. So you will be seeing uh, Exembles Enterprise, our back office and our integration with the digital document technology from uh, Enikio. So we start the process by selecting the guarantee reference on the back of this 1047. I'm going to issue it. Like I said, all the data is there. I'm just quickly gonna run through it, the details of the guarantee, all the wording, which is the template, Commissions, information, I'm just going to change it quickly. This is to automate the batch process for the commissions. And this is for the PDF diehards. This is not the digital document yet, but some users, especially business users, they want to see a PDF file. So if you want to see a PDF file, we can give them a PDF file. But it is not the original document. This is just a template, a mapped, uh, a simple mapping exercise into PDF. 
I'm going to release this guarantee now, and that's the first time or, or the first time we use our APIs with uh, the uh, Trace Original technology. I'm going to sort by new, look for transaction reference 1047. I'm going to pick it up and supervise release this transaction. I can start reviewing all the data, but I'm not going to waste my time on that. Uh, that business data, we can do a deep dive session if you're really interested in this. But I'm going to confirm this. What happens now is, the moment I confirm this transaction, instead of something printed, something going to Swift, we're creating a record on the full node of Trace Original. And we also, at the same time, send an email notification. It could be through other channels. What we've done is, the lowest friction possible, an email to the beneficiary, the Swedish government. So the Swedish government gets immediately a notification of this issued guarantee in their favor. It's just a notification. They can check whether this is real because the notary can already do its work. What we've created here is this is our doc viewer. It's our digital document viewer. We've created sort of a, a user interface on top of this to view the data in a structured format. These are the parties, the applicant, the beneficiary, the guarantor, which is a bank, and then more structured information in the agreement terms. This is all data we can use for STP purposes. Also the corporate, the beneficiary, or the Swedish government can use this. And here you can see already something we've done. We've made it truly digital. We've put secure tokens in place to also trigger additional business processes in a digital way on this guarantee, which is normally a piece of paper, where you send paper if you want to do something with it. So this is the wording. As you can see, a banker can easily read this. Yeah. Now to transfer the document, as I explained before with the PKI infrastructure, the beneficiary, if they accept this guarantee, they have to provide their public key. So this is a secure token. So this is a secure page. There is a direct interface into the back office of Exit Builds. Our back office will receive this uh, message and we will have an STP process in place where we automatically transfer the ownership and replace the owner key on the notary service. So immediately, this is in a couple of seconds, two seconds or less, the beneficiary is immediately notified that the guarantee has been issued. So no user intervention on this. It's all through APIs. This is the same data. The agreement terms are there. And at this point, if the, if the beneficiary said, I want to see this guarantee, or I want to integrate it, you can have integration here, APIs with your own internal ERP system or whatever, or you can simply download and store it into a DMS system. As you can see here, such a written request for a claim a normal claim in a guarantee is done by a piece of paper. Someone goes into Word, creates a claim, and sends a piece of paper to the bank, not in a digital world. There is a claim URL which will create a digital claim. I'm now going to download this guarantee, and you're just going to see this in Notepad. Yeah? This is what it looks like in Notepad, the digital guarantee. There is a structured JSON schema inside. The techies understand that much better than I do, but this is typically where you can use your STP engine. And then there's a human readable part of in the guarantee, which is down below. So you can print this, we can create a PDF for it, whatever you want to do with it, but normally you would store this inside typically the NMS or an enterprise content management system. The next part I'm going to do now is typically, well, usually nothing happens with this guarantee. It's simply filed for many, many years, but I'm now going to execute a claim. Now, the bank, if a bank receives a claim, of course, the bank has to make sure that the party who does the claim can prove that he's authorized, that he's actually the holder. So I'm now going to show you, we've not, we've not integrated this with an API yet, but this is the, this is the DLT ledger. This is the trace original ledger. And here you have all the functions that allow you to actually interact with the ledger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a proof of ownership. In the next version, you have an API. So I've now uploaded the guarantee. And the system says, yes, it is an exact copy of the current digital original. Why does it say copy? 
because everyone can have, there's multiple people can have a copy. The only original will be based on the private key. Yeah. So that's why it says it's a copy of the digital original. So it does a content hash check. It does not check the owner key yet. The owner key check will be in the next step, the verify ownership. So here, the owner has to enter his private key, and that's the key to the kingdom. If you can prove that you are the holder of the private key, I will give you access to the claims page. So we will be uploading this proof of ownership to the digital claims page. Again, in the next version, this will be all API driven. No user intervention on this. Yeah. So I'm showing in our manual what happened. So I've now downloaded the proof of ownership. And if you remember in the next part of my demo, I was going to do the digital claim, but only the party that is the owner of the guarantee should be authorized to do this claim. So I'm going back to my claims page, and it says drop your proof of ownership file here. So I'm gonna go back to my downloaded proof of ownership. If I upload this, at this point, the owner key, the digital notary, which is in the background, you're not seeing it, but it's a DLT application, it will check, it will verify the ownership. It will give you access to a secure, again, a digital token, a secure page here, where we can actually provide data on the guarantee. As you can see, the reference is at the top, 1047. I'm gonna speed up the data entry a little bit because uh, this is SWIFT compliant. Uh, in fact, already with the 2021 standards, we can also do checks against the maximum amount for the claim because we know what guarantee it is about. So I'm quickly going to enter all the other data and submit this claim. So this is again a page, it's not a portal. This is just a secure token URL, which will push this data straight into the Exim Bills back office. And we can generate a notification to the back office user. Yeah, this is my account, now you know who my bank is. Well, so I'm gonna submit this claim. It was registered successfully. At this point, I'm going back into our back office system, but what our back office has done in real time, as is, you're supposed to do in the digital world, we're immediately confirming to the Swedish government, we've received your demand request. All the data you saw entered on that page is now automatically put into an email, so at least the Swedish government knows, yes, the bank is working on this, they're doing something. I will now go into the last step of the process, uh, going back into the back office, and I'll show you what has happened with this guarantee. Because I did not use the system that much. Uh, there's been a lot of things happen behind the scenes in STP mode. So if I take my guarantee 1047, there's about five steps on the guarantee, which are the five same steps in the manual world, the swift world, as the digital world. It's an application, it's a process, an issuance, transfer of ownership and, and a claim. They're all there, but what is remarkable, three out of five steps are robotic actions. We use an STP process, which interacts with the ledger automatically and generates those events on the system. The last step in the process is processing the claim to show you that the date is actually there. The process demand request step, and here the back office user will be able to pick up the data submitted by the Swedish government. So everything which was captured on that secure page, because the Swedish government is not a customer of my bank, is automatically captured here. And there's an API in place to, to capture all that information. If I go to the demand details, pay or extend the demand type, all the data that was entered, the user can simply review it, and he can go to his decision process where he can say, I'm gonna honor this claim, I'm refusing the claim, or I'll enter into negotiations with applicant and beneficiary on the claim. So this is, uh, this is the process. It's uh, like I said, I've gone, I apologize because I think I've gone quite fast. 
uh, it's probably quite difficult to follow, but that's sort of what the business process is. Like I said, we can organize deep dive sessions, but I've tried to respect the half hour that I have been given. Uh, and this is sort of the end of my demonstration. Uh, if, if I can give maybe one minute, I'll probably explain this slide and then we start with questions. I'd like to share still this, is, is, then I'll stop talking here. This is sort of our view and it's actually a message to the DSI, the Digital Standards Initiative. There's a lot of activity going on in trade messaging standards, but there is one big risk uh, that Everyone is talking about being customer centric. Now, if we are truly customer centric, then we're talking about in trade, it's the SMEs, it's the corporates, because every trade transaction does not start with a bank, it does not start with an insurer, it does not start with, with a piece of technology, it starts with a trade agreement between two parties. And I know Bolero. I think Ross will know this because they a long time back came up with a trade agreement on the surf. Uh, it starts all with a purchase order or a sales order between two parties. The two key documents in trade, uh, which, which everything else comes out of those two documents, it's a purchase order and an invoice. Whatever trade business, whether it's open account, whether it's LCs, whether it's collections, whether it's supply chain finance, they have something in common purchase order, an invoice, and a settlement. So if you really want to talk about trade messaging standards, we should not say, oh, we're going to develop a solution where we're moving from swift letters of credit, and we can do letters of credit much smarter. Then, you, then you're, you're driven, if that is your, your approach, you're actually saying, oh, or like, we can actually provide a better solution for an existing product. You get again into your product silo approach. Or you say, oh, that we're going to replace that part of the market. I'm not saying that is not an approach that will not work. But if you really are customer centric, you, you tackle it from the source. Because in my opinion, all trade finance, all supply chain finance, all settlement services, financing service, reconciliation, insurance, risk distribution, transport, logistics, certifications, it's all services that are offered on top of this core trade data set. Yeah. It's remarkable that in the world of e-invoicing, some people may know this terminology, a PO flip, a purchase order flip. What is a purchase order flip? It's using the purchase order source data to auto-generate an electronic invoice. Why can't we use PO flip to issue an LC? Because an LC is actually nothing more then a purchase order or a set of purchase order enriched with some instructions. It's a smart contract around purchase order data. Yeah? The same thing for invoices, the same thing, a shipment instruction is again something which can start from a flip. Yeah? Uh, 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 an invoice flip or, or, or a purchase order flip. So it's based on the concept that if, if digitization really looks at the core, we should, the industry should define a core trade document data. What is the common denominator for this source data? And start from there. And based on that, you can actually, via APIs, insurance should be a service. Finance is a service. Settlement is a service. Yeah? Even logistics is a service offered on a trade contract. That's what we see as, as, as the, 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 the really a customer-centric approach. Take a look at accounts payable and accounts receivable. Take a real customer view and all the products that come out of it, bank payment commitment, bank payment undertaking, uh, DLPC, EPU, the bill of exchange, it flows out of this. Yeah? So that's sort of uh, the vision we believe in. And, and, and I, like I said, I can keep talking about this one for a long time, but I'll stop here for now to, to, to give still time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. That was a very interesting presentation. Very insightful. I mean, very deep in detail. It's about international trade. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you one 
actually, uh, there is actually another document which is pretty fundamental in uh, international trade transactions, which is the BL, Bill of Lading. Yeah. It's a real headache, believe me, when you literally have to deal with transactions. It has so many aspects, legal aspects, so many comparative aspects. Yeah. Somebody asked for that one that you uh, deal with LCs, where you deal with open account. Yeah. And yeah. That but that's correct but if you really focus on those legal aspects uh you know and uh, i we are partners of bolero as well yeah. the legal aspects are often a consequence of a, of the interpretation of data on a specific platform yeah, yeah? because the moment you start defining a let's say a central repository uh, whether it's a dot based or a non dot based the moment you start defining a semantic model you have to sort of say, what does this data really mean in the business world? What will happen is, if the nine types of bill of lading, if they manage to define a common denominator, yeah, across those nine types, the secret sauce and the rule books will eventually, in my opinion, disappear. Why? Because you do not, if there is a common understanding of what data is from a legal point of view, then you do not need the rule book specific approach based on one ecosystem. That's at least my opinion. Well, you, you put the right, you know, you point out the real problem, just defining what we talking about right now in international trade. Are we talking again with documents or data instead? Well, good point. About data. No, I'm, I'm well, no, I'll, I'll explain that. I had a slide of that as well, but I'll try to explain. Everyone will agree, yeah? today you have physical documents. Let me take this slide again, uh, this one. This is what you have today. If I purely make abstraction of what would be the best solution in the world, then I would create a DLT-based solution and make all those parties, actors or participants, I will all onboard them and create one digital trade data record. I would immediately go from document to data. The reality is that is that, like I said, you know, if you create a vertical solution in a specific industry, maybe that approach will work. But everyone will know. I've been in trade now for 32 years. I've seen many come and many go, and some have survived, but still the critical mass has not been achieved. Why not? because this is a far too competitive space. Yeah? There is room for everyone, but we have to recognize that the value is not on, on, on creating, actually be the owner of that digital document. Because if you think that, that you can move straight from, digital, from, from a physical document to creating a data record and making that with the same characteristics of the physical one, then everyone needs a rule book. And I believe that is the wrong approach. There is a better way where you say, let's accept the competitive aspects because there are thousands, millions of people behind all those systems. How can you adopt an infrastructure where you mimic the physical flow of a document where a document can digitally flow, but you can start using digital identity across, that is an ongoing project, but you can use a digital notary, which could be used by any of those systems to prove originality, integrity, authenticity, and ownership. This is where DLT should be used. DLT I, I, should, I, yeah, I, I that's agree my with you, Joel. I perfectly agree. Maybe you didn't, I, I wasn't clear enough. Uh, to have a sort of double channel, that's what I, I was meaning. Uh, you have to create physicality and digital world yeah. we you know work in in parallel and in synergy that's yeah. my understanding you cannot escape from a yeah. really purely physical uh, world such as trade is nowadays we have yeah. nowadays it, it's still based heavily on paper-based documents so you cannot escape from that picture from a day to another and you know step into a fully digital world. You have to create a sort of double world 
it would be a hybrid world, correct. But like I said, from our application, the moment, you know, it, we, for us, it's no extra work. The digital notary actually creates low friction. Why? Because there's no business data. The moment you offer a public service, then you get into permissions. You get into all sorts of complexity. And that's why, why are all the blockchain platforms, why are they so, why is it difficult for them to create critical mass? Because trade is so much intertwined with that physical document. But you can create a digital one. Here I have digital delivery. I call it, I go from physical to digital delivery. So there's a file. There's a file being transported digitally through existing infrastructure, APIs, SWIFT, connectivity, host-to-host -host connectivity. But this is the neutral DLT-based service that everyone can use. Everyone is verifying the truth. This is where the truth lies, but it's a technical verification process. The business data still flows here. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about it. All the efficiencies, the intelligence, we can reuse it. We only control the, the hashes, the, the, the technical aspects of the document in, in DLT. But this can be DLT, yeah? This could be, this could be WeTrade, this could be Congo. This could, we don't care. That's why this is the world of today, and that's going to be the world we live in for many years. But this is why we believe this is the lowest friction approach. Create a DLT-based digital notary. Perfect. Is there anybody else who would like to make questions to Joel? I hope I've not lost too many people. <laughs> hey, Joel, Joel, it's Ross. Yes. Ross from Bolero. Could I ask Hi, you a question? Sure, sure, Ross. You, you know, the, the, like the end game is, is not necessarily what we see in front of us, and we have good technology and, and the key players, but have you put this in front of, say, some of the more... Uh, the, the ones that sort of become the barriers at the end, like regulatory entities, you know, governments, customs, those type well, of players. Yeah, we'll have our first, thank you. It's a very good question, Ross, because that's indeed, we are, like I said, we can, we can theoretically fantasize about what technology can do, but that's, we're not really interested in that yet. China Systems, we're not, we are the first vendor who actually put this into reality, but our approach is like this. We prove what the technology can do we have the vision, now we have to prove it. And you're right, the barriers are there. So we're having our first, because this is all quite recent, yeah? This has been done quite recently. We will have our first test with the digital guarantee in a specific jurisdiction. And with guarantees, you have actually, because the guarantee is the legal document. And we'll be testing it in a specific country and with uh, a number of banks involved and a chamber of commerce. And it's a country typically where the government and the chamber of commerce and the bank are all quite, I would say, they have quite a close relationship. So we're trying to create the lowest barriers possible because indeed the moment you start going into legal aspects, let's be honest, everyone has a business behind this. Bolero has a business, uh, you have your know-how, you have your IP. So you automatically get, first of all, defensive reactions. So you can choose, yeah, how do I protect my model? Yeah, But there is one thing which is undoubtedly going to happen and it's gonna be with hurdles, open standards, yeah. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the industry, you can try to protect your business uh, as long as you can, and it's normal. China, we also have a retention strategy. We have, a quite, we have more than 120 customers. So we have to make sure that we can keep doing those customers' business. However, the world is moving in this direction, open standards. So, and yes, the law is still a challenge. However, even the law, like I said, if the standard is going to get resolved, uh, you know, there's, there's, we, there's a lot of things happening there as well. So we're going to test this now with a digital guarantee in a specific part of the world with a chamber of commerce involved because they could be the digital notary. The key thing is that the digital notary, they have to realize, uh, and th those should typically be 
neutral institutions, the ICC, for example, should also be interested in this because if they truly believe in a standard and, and they, they want to avoid being considered to be a club because that's a risk that you start seeing, oh, who is doing digitization? Oh, these guys are doing digitization. There is a risk that you get a specific flavor of a, of a certain standard. And that would, in me, my opinion, be wrong. To do standards, you need a digital container, an open standard. It should be technology independent. Although I'm the first one to agree that distributed ledger technology is, is the most suitable technology for, for trade because you have so many participants. Uh, but uh, you need to get, this is where you need to do the convincing that, that, that at government level, ICC level, chambers of commerce start realizing this. So I will, I'm the first one to agree, yes, it is a challenge. Why? Because of competition, protection mechanism, retention, strategy, et cetera. That's the reality. So it's, we've just started. Uh, you will see probably, Ross, what's going to happen in the market. But I also know that Bolero, you're part of, what is it called, the DCSA? You're part of the digital container shipping uh, you're part of this exercise, and they, you're, you're one of the partners they're talking to, together with SDOCs, to actually move from nine bills of lading to one. Will it happen? The market will, will, will show. But I'm a true believer that the competition should be of the service. If we really care about these people, and these people are really the owners of the trade business, if you really care about these people, we should go for open standards and compete on the service, not on the standard. That is, I'm very convinced about that. I'll stop talking, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. I think our hour is up anyway, the time. Sorry? I think the, time, the time's up, our hour is finished. So. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it is. So I think we, we will meet again in two weeks for the next session. It was a, a very interesting one, and I would like to thank personally Joel for his uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. On, on the 7th of July, and thanks for attending today. Take care, everybody. Keep safe. Thank, Thank you, care. everyone. And if you have questions, you can always follow up through Andrea or to me directly. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye. Bye.